Hello, I'm here to talk to you about nickel. Nickel is a transition metal, and I think it's pretty cool in that it is one of only four elements that is ferromagnetic at room temperature. Well, what is ferromagnetic? What is ferromagnetism? Ferromagnetism, or something that is ferromagnetic, um, will be attracted to a magnetic field, but that's like something that's paramagnetic, which is much more common. What's special about ferromagnetism is that if you were ta to take that lump of metal and, say, take a magnet and stroke it in the right direction, then the, all the um, magnetic moments of all the uh, atoms in that lump of metal will align, and the entire metal becomes a dipole. So you're going to have two poles on this lump of metal. It turns into a magnet. That's what's special about ferromagnetism, and there are many, many elements that are ferromagnetic at very low temperatures. But at a temperature that's, high, that's so high, such as room temperature, which in, in the scheme of things, well, it depends, you could think of it as very low or very high, but it's very far from absolute zero, it's actually quite rare to have something be ferromagnetic, and there are only four pure elements that are ferromagnetic. Iron, cobalt, nickel, and gadolinium. And iron is the one that's thought of mainly as being ferromagnetic, but nickel is as well. And nickel is actually used in some mid-strength magnets that are a bit stronger than, um, than iron magnets and can be a lot smaller than iron magnets, but they're, they're weaker than the rare earth and neodymium magnets. Its main use, however, is in alloying with iron to make steel. The most common of these steels is stainless steel. Stainless steel is made out of iron, nickel, and chromium of varying percentages. And it has really revolutionized uh, everything from cookware to uh, very, very high-performing scientific apparatus. Um, so nickel is, you, you should thank nickel whenever you, you use something that's made out of stainless steel. Um, Nickel is also is was for a long time used in coinage, but because some people develop a uh, skin allergy to nickel, and because it is more expensive than uh, steel or iron, many uh, now it is being phased out, and stainless steel and other cheaper alternatives are being used. So I'm now going to head down to the lab, and I'm going to do some interesting nickel chemistry. First, I am simply going to show you um, time-lapsed footage of nickel dissolving in hot hydrochloric acid. And when I say dissolve, I actually mean oxidize and react with hydrochloric acid to make a nice green solution of nickel to chloride. Before we get into more hardcore nickel aqueous chemistry, I thought it would be cool to show you nickel reacting with uh, hydrochloric acid and getting into solution. So there's some nickel metal and it's in hydrochloric acid right now and what's going on is it's very slowly reacting with the hydrochloric acid getting oxidized to nickel 2 plus and making a solution of nickel dichloride. Now nickel reacts extremely slowly with hydrochloric acid in fact at uh, room temperature it doesn't really react at all. It'll only react with constant heating and even so it reacts very slowly. I've time-lapsed the following footage over two hours, and it's a bit choppy because my camera only takes one picture per minute. Can't take more pictures than that. But this is a time-lapse, and um, you see that after about two hours, the solution gets a really, like, a really nice uh, greenish color. Um, so here is the concentrated solution, and uh, here I am boiling down the solution even more. Um, as it gets very concentrated, or eventually, all the water leaves the crystal structure and it becomes anhydrous and then it's a nice yellow color. Now let's play around with some uh, nickel dichloride that I got from a chemical supplier. I'll dissolve it in water, make a nice uh, tetra or uh, hexa aqua complex by doing that. I'll make a tetrachloro complex and a hexa amine complex and we'll observe, observe the nice color changes involved with each. So Right now, I'm just going to get some nickel chloride hexahydrate into solution. Just going to dissolve it in water. So now I have the salt dissolved in water, and this is the hexa aqua complex of nickel 2 chloride. I'm now going to add some aqueous, concentrated aqueous ammonia, and ammonia is a stronger nucleophile than the water, so it's displacing the water in the complex, forming this really nice blue hexaamine complex. 
there's no oxidation or reduction going on. The uh, molecule is simply just changing shape and therefore the color is changing. Here we have some hexa-aqua complex and right now I'm adding uh, chloride ions in the form of hydrochloric acid to it. Now at first you don't see much of a color change and this is because although chloride ions are stronger nucleophiles than water and will eventually displace the water in the complex, they're only stronger at higher temperature as you can see from the chemical equation below. So as I heat up the test tube uh, the equilibrium is shifted to the right because heat is on the left side of the equation. So you start to see a stronger yellow color, which is from the tetrachloro complex. I am now going to bring nickel to a very unusual and rare oxidation state, plus four. Using ammonium persulfate, I oxidize nickel to chloride all the way up to nickel 4 oxide or nickel dioxide. I then explore some of the properties of this nickel dioxide. One more note, you might be wondering why I'm not making nickel 4 chloride or nickel 4 um, bromide or some, some nice halide of nickel 4 so you can really see it dissolve in water and really see the color of nickel in the 4 plus oxidation state. And the reason, for, the reason that I'm doing an oxide is because uh, pretty much you can only get oxides and fluorides and some sulfides for nickel in, in the 4 plus oxidation state. And because I have done zero fluorine chemistry and I don't have any fluorine compounds on hand, I'm, I can't make nickel for fluoride. I don't have any fluorine. So um, we'll have to settle with the oxide. And anyway, nickel for fluor fluoride uh, doesn't dissolve in water, it reacts with water before it dissolves, so you couldn't see it, a nice uh, dissolved version of it, only the anhydrous version, which is anyway what you're seeing with the oxide. Here once again is the um, dissolved nickel dichloride, and I am going to make a very rare um, oxide of nickel. It will feature nickel in the 4 plus oxidation state. What I am now doing is I am adding a solution, a concentrated solution of sodium persulfate to the, um, to the solution. And sodium persulfate is a very strong oxidizer, but it really will only work in alkaline conditions. So I'm adding now some sodium hydroxide, and the instant I add the sodium hydroxide, you can see that there are black pellets formed at the bottom of the test tube. This is the oxide. Now, as I heat the test tube, and I apologize for the blurriness of the camera at this point, you see that, the, that there's quite a bit more of this oxide formed. So this is nickel 4 oxide, or nickel dioxide. I am now going to add some nitric acid to the test tube, which will decompose the dioxide, forming normal nickel 2 plus ions. You'll see that the solution clears up, and you're left with the normal kind of greenish blue color of nickel 2 plus ions. So here's another sample of the nickel dioxide. And here I'm going to add hydrochloric acid. Now, unlike nitric acid, in here, here the nickel dioxide is actually powerful and um, powerful enough oxidizer to oxidize the chloride to chlorine. So right now, if you if you do this live, you will smell chlorine quite strongly. Now, there's also some decomposition going on, which is why you see that the, the color clears up. So that's a very nice reaction as well.